Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to dive into one of the more classic Southern Plains tornado outbreaks in recent memory. Many of you have been asking me to cover this event for quite some time now, so we're going to take a look at it today, and that is the May 24th, 2011 tornado outbreak. This was a multi-state outbreak with the most destructive tornadoes occurring in central Oklahoma, including the infamous EF5 that tracked for over 60 miles through places like El Reno and Piedmont. The atmosphere was extremely conducive for strong to violent tornadoes on this day, and in this video we're going to analyze why that was the case. We're also very fortunate to have a ton of incredible data from multiple high-resolution rapid scan radars, so this video will be a little more intensive on the storm behavior front than normal. We're still going to dive deep into the meteorology of the event, but because we have such high-resolution data, we'll be able to really analyze the nuances in the structure and behavior of some of these storms. Of course, we won't be able to talk about every single feature of interest from this outbreak or else this video would be hours long. So we're going to focus on the Oklahoma portion of the event where the most intense long track tornadic supercells occurred. This was a very well documented outbreak and numerous journal articles have been written on different aspects of the event. As always, I'll put a link to all of the articles I used in my research for this video, including those I mentioned in this video and some additional ones in the description box below so you can do some research on your own. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Just a quick note before we dive in, I just created a Patreon page, so if you're interested in supporting the channel and getting some extra perks, head on over to patreon.com slash convective chronicles. May 24th, 2011 was a very well forecast event, but model discrepancy and the potential for convection from the day before to negatively impact the environment dissuaded the Storm Prediction Center from adding in a risk area until the day four outlook rolled around on May 21st. Confidence rapidly increased over the next few days, and so did the threat of a classic Southern Plains tornado outbreak. By the morning outlook on May 24th, a rare high risk had been outlined from southern Kansas into Oklahoma, with a corresponding 30% hatched area for significant tornadoes. The high risk was expanded at the 1630 outlook, and tornado probabilities were increased to 45% hatched, along with a very rare 60% hatched area for large hail focused on central Oklahoma. We ended the event with nearly 600 severe reports, including 57 tornado reports from Kansas into Oklahoma, North Texas, and the Ozarks. Take a look at all of the radar-estimated low-level rotation tracks across the Southern Plains on May 24th. You see a few up in Kansas, a concentrated bunch down in North Texas, and several persistent lengthy rotation tracks across Central Oklahoma, showing you where those long-track tornadic supercells wreaked havoc. 12 tornadoes occurred in the NWS Norman CWA alone, including two EF3s, two EF4s that tracked into the very southern fringes of the Oklahoma City metro, and an EF5 that tore a 63-mile-long path from near El Reno to Guthrie, north of Oklahoma City. All right, let's dive into the meteorology behind this event. We were right on the heels of the Joplin, Missouri tornado event just two days earlier, so this was a continuation of a very active period for severe weather across the central and southern U.S., We'll start out, as always, at 500 millibars at 12Z, 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time on May 24th, about eight hours and change before the tornadic activity would begin. And this is about as classic a look as it gets for a Plains tornado outbreak. Beautiful, negatively tilted trough digging down into the desert southwest, ejecting into the southern plains during the day, taking on even more negative tilt. 70 to 80 knots of flow rounding the base of the trough, signaling an intense mature wave was making its way into the southern plains, timed perfectly with peak daytime heating. Going up to 300 millibars, we see an even more classic look. Strongly defluent flow in the exit region of the trough. As the trough takes on an increasingly negative tilt with time, you can really see those wind vectors spread apart over Kansas and Oklahoma. If you've watched the channel for any length of time, you know what defluence is and why it's important. It's the spreading apart of those wind vectors in the upper atmosphere, which creates a void. To fill that void, air from the low levels is brought upward, and that's how we get synoptic scale rising motion that primes the environment for storm formation in these severe weather setups, and this is an absolutely textbook example of that. The trough features a classic cyclonically or counterclockwise curved jet streak, and if we were to break that up into our conceptual four quadrant model, we're smack dab in that left exit region. We've done a bunch of case studies on this channel, and a lot of them were situated in, say, the right entrance region of a jet, or just received a glancing blow from a trough. Not this one. This was your standard left exit region severe weather event. As you may remember, the left exit region of a jet streak or trough is a favored quadrant for upward motion. It's kind of considered the quote-unquote quintessential tornado outbreak location within a trough or jet streak. Of course, there have been plenty of big events outside the left exit region, as that upward motion in the left exit region can bleed into specifically the right exit region, but May 24th was situated well within that left exit region of the trough. 
With such an intense, negatively tilted trough traversing the southern Rockies, you'd expect robust surface load development to take place somewhere in the central to southern high plains, and that's exactly what happened. Lee cyclogenesis was well underway by 12Z, centered over the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles, and the low would rapidly deepen and inch east throughout the day as the trough ejected into the southern plains. As we've discussed before, these negatively tilted troughs are often associated with a more robust low-level response, and that was certainly the case here. That low quickly dropped to sub-994 millibars and, as a result, those surface winds really strengthened and back in the warm sector, helping to increase that deep layer shear for supercells and pump moisture northward into the region. Zooming in on our raw surface data, we can really see this in action. Here's our surface low at 12Z, 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time, counterclockwise flow around the center, which would probably be somewhere here in the Oklahoma Panhandle or extreme northern Texas Panhandle. We had a well-defined dry line draped down to the south across the eastern Texas Panhandle, far southwest Oklahoma into west Texas. Dew points in the teens and 20s across eastern New Mexico into west Texas, 60s and 70s to the east. Now, since we'd had an active stretch preceding this with nothing to scour out the low-level moisture, ample moisture was already in place across the warm sector, so we didn't need rapid moisture reduction to aid this setup, but we got it anyway. As the surface low moved east and rapidly deepened, those southerly or south-southeasterly surface winds strengthened to 20 plus knots, yielding strong moisture reduction into Oklahoma. Widespread low 70s dew points by 18Z just before storm initiation. This station just north of Oklahoma City had jumped from 65 at 12Z to 72 at 18Z. OKC had jumped from 68 to 72 in the same time frame. The dry line itself had mixed east as well. At 18Z, it was situated somewhere in here, a bit more diffuse with northern extent, but very tight with southern extent into Oklahoma. This would be our main initiation mechanism given moderate convergence along it. Southwesterly winds on the west side of the boundary, southerly flow to the east. Deep layer shear vectors were oriented adequately off the dry line. You'd like to see maybe a little greater of an angle between the initiating boundary and the shear vectors, perhaps leaving some slight question over the degree of storm interactions and how that would impact storm mode and longevity. The angle was right in that gray area that might foster somewhat of a mixed convective mode, but there was enough perpendicularity to where discrete to semi-discrete supercells were a strong possibility, especially as storms moved off the dry line and matured, turning to the right of the mean flow, and especially given that overall forcing along the dry line was not overwhelming with only moderate convergence and relatively slow eastward progress. At 850 millibars, a 30 plus knot low level jet was in place to start the day across the southern plains. That would decrease somewhat through the first half of the day, but would rapidly increase and back slightly as that low level cyclone deepened through the afternoon. By mid afternoon, we saw 35 to 40 knots overspread much of Oklahoma and North Texas, further increasing to 50 plus knots by 0Z. Let's look at a couple of observed soundings from Norman, Oklahoma at 12Z and 18Z just to get a sense of how the environment was evolving through the morning. As always, we'll go through our more in-depth wrap proximity sounding analysis in a little bit. Starting at 12Z, we already have pretty robust instability in place. Nearly 2,500 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape already at 7 a.m. Moist layer extending up to about 850 millibars beneath a very deep, stout, elevated mixed layer. That layer of warm, dry, well-mixed air that emanates on the higher terrain out west and gets transported east atop the low-level moist layer. You can even trace this EML back to its origin. We're going to go back 36 hours to the evening of May 22nd, and we're going to look at the 0Z sounding at El Paso, Texas. So again, this is 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time on May 22nd, two days before our tornado outbreak. You can see this deep layer of very steep lapse rates extending up from the surface, representative of a very warm, well-mixed layer. Well, if we compare this to our 12Z Norman sounding from May 24th, you'll see that this area here, right above the moist layer, is exactly the same as it was at El Paso two days earlier. I'll go back and forth between the soundings a couple times so you can see this. That is our elevated mixed layer. It got transported from the area out west upon the southwesterly mid-level flow, and eventually set up over the southern plains, acting as a stout cap on the atmosphere to prohibit early day storm development and allow instability to build on the 24th. This is really just a classic loaded gun sounding, just awaiting a mechanism to erode the cap and initiate explosive thunderstorm development. By 18Z, instability had continued to increase up to about 3,200 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. We'd seen some modest erosion of the capping inversion, mostly thanks to surface heating, as temperatures were now up into the upper 70s, but it was remaining fairly stubborn as the main upper trough, our synoptic scale forcing mechanism that would be able to lift and cool that cap, was just starting to impinge on western and central Oklahoma at this time. That cap would quickly erode as the trough moved in over the next couple of hours and as the temperatures continued to warm, and that, coupled with convergence along the dry line, would initiate storms shortly thereafter. 
The wind profile was also very favorable for supercells with strong deep layer shear of about 45 knots and adequate low level shear evidenced by a bit of low level hodograph curvature that was increasing with time. This is just such a textbook look right before a prolific tornado outbreak. I apologize for using the words classic and textbook so much, but if there was ever a chapter in a textbook on Southern Plains tornado outbreak environments, everything you've seen so far from May 24, 2011 would be in there. Strong, negatively tilted trough moving in right at peak heating, beautiful defluence aloft in its exit region, rapidly deepening surface low, ample low-level moisture beneath a rapidly eroding cap, strong instability, and a wind profile favorable for discrete or semi-discrete supercells that was improving with time. That is the baseline recipe for a tornado outbreak in the plains. Nothing quirky, like a random boundary or something. What made this setup unique was that every single box was checked for a prolific tornado outbreak. Looking at visible satellite, we saw clear skies immediately ahead of the dry line in western Oklahoma all morning. That elevated mixed layer and a lack of early forcing mechanisms kept the warm sector free and clear of convection. By midday, we started to see some bubbly cumulus along the dry line, and from that would come our initial attempts at convection by about 1.30 p.m. We do have some of these roll clouds downstream of this activity across central Oklahoma, which indicates some low-level stability. Not too surprising given what we saw on our observed soundings from Norman. That capping inversion was a bit stubborn, but again, it would erode pretty quickly as temps continued to warm and once that synoptic forcing from the upper trough moved in. The first blips went up along the dry line from far northwest Texas to western Oklahoma around 1830Z or 1.30pm and rapidly intensified into supercells given the very favorable environment. The northern storm in particular quickly became the first storm of interest for the event, and that would go on to produce the EF3 that went right over Canton Lake in far northwest Blaine County. That storm quickly dissipated. In the meantime, to the south, multiple updrafts would coalesce to form this supercell, which became the storm that would produce first the EF3 near Lukiba, and then the long track EF5 from near El Reno to Piedmont to Guthrie. Additional storms continued to develop southward along the dry line, and from this activity, after some mergers and reorganization, a couple of supercells developed, both of which would produce long-track EF4 tornadoes tracking toward the OKC metro. The northern storm gave birth to the Chickasha-Blanchard-Newcastle tornado, while the southern EF4 tracked from near Washington to Goldsby. The other supercells to the south in Oklahoma failed to produce tornadoes, and the storm mode eventually did become less favorable for tornadoes northeast of the OKC metro. All right, let's dive into some of the unique behaviors and characteristics that these storms exhibited. Since there were multiple notable storms on this day, we're going to dive into them one by one, focusing on the El Reno Piedmont EF5 tornado and supercell. But let's start off with the first storm of the day, the one that produced the Canton Lake EF3. This tornado exhibited very intense motion, starting out as a stout stovepipe around 3.20 p.m., before morphing into a wedge as it crossed directly over Canton Lake. The supercell would go on to produce another more brief tornado near Fairview before dissipating. The first interesting feature of this storm was that you could kind of tell on radar when it was changing character from an organizing hail producer to a mature tornadic supercell. For reference, here is Canton Lake. You can see as it's getting its act together, it develops a robust reflectivity core, likely indicating large hail. The storm is perhaps elevated above the increasing low-level shear at this point, and with more than adequate instability profiles for deep, robust updrafts, Hail was a notable hazard with this storm and with many of the other organizing updrafts. Then in 1956Z, it loses its deep reflectivity core. The rear flight downdraft begins to swing around and a well-defined hook echo develops. At this point, the storm is now surface-based, the hail threat has subsided, and the short-term hazard is transitioning to more of a tornado risk. And around 3.20 p.m., we get intense tornado genesis near Canton Lake. We can see this even better from the Oklahoma City radar, which gives us a bit of a higher up view into the storm because it's farther away than the Vance Air Force Base radar we were just using. Very large, robust reflectivity core develops early on, and then boom. The core goes away, the storm takes on a much more classic tornadic supercell shape, and we get tornado genesis over Canton Lake. So it's interesting that we were able to actually observe a distinct change in the characteristics and the preferred hazards of this storm, which gives us a clue that the environment the storm was experiencing was changing for the better from a tornado perspective. We also get a great look at the occlusion process of the tornado from the Vance Air Force Base radar. Here's our tornado vortex signature as the tornado was beginning, and you can see about halfway through the tornado life cycle, the vortex detaches from the parent mesocyclone and begins to move basically due north, advected by the low-level flow before dissipating completely. Now, after the Canton Lake tornado, this storm produced a brief tornado near Fairview and then basically shriveled into thin air, as you see at the top of your screen. This didn't make a whole lot of sense given the expectation for long-lived tornadic supercells, so the question is, why wasn't this storm able to survive longer? Really, all storms that ventured this far north struggled to remain robust. Even this beefy supercell lost its steam the farther northeast it tracked, 
and there's a void in the storm reports north and northeast of the Canton Lake storm. Well, it looks like these storms tracked into an area of much less favorable thermodynamics. Here's a series of RAP model proximity soundings from 17 to 20Z, noon to 3 p.m. at Enid, Oklahoma, which is about 45 miles northeast of Canton Lake. The first thing you'll notice is much worse low-level moisture quality than farther south. Whereas we had increasing moisture and a moderately deep moist layer up to about 850 millibars at Norman, at Enid the surface dew point is decreasing with time and the temperature and dew point profiles become quite separated in the low levels indicating a much drier, lower quality air mass. In addition, the cap remained quite stubborn up here. That warm nose became more and more stout with each successive model initialization. About negative 200 joules per kilogram of mixed layer convective inhibition by 20Z, which is just too much to overcome even for mature ongoing supercells. We've talked before about how mature supercells can and often do persist for quite a while into less favorable, more capped environments, but this is simply too much convective inhibition to overcome, even for a significant tornado producer like the Canton Lake Storm. You can even see it on plots of mixed layer cape and convective inhibition from the SBC Mesoanalysis Archive. Even though the area ahead of the dry line destabilizes nicely by early afternoon, especially with southern extent, there's still a big chunk of remaining convective inhibition which was represented by the blue shading, dark blue meaning stronger convective inhibition, across northwest Oklahoma. So the Canton Lake storm was able to tap into the favorable environment for a little bit, but was eventually stifled by poor thermodynamics as it moved northeast. Farther to the south was a different story. Let's move on to the big one, our EF5 producer. This storm originated from a cluster of updrafts that formed in southwest Oklahoma, went through some mergers, and eventually produced its first tornado at 3.31 p.m., a large EF3 wedge that tore a nine-mile path near Lukiba. This tornado dissipated at 3.46 p.m. and was followed by the most intense tornado of the outbreak, a massive EF5 that began at 3.50 p.m. just east of Hinton. It quickly strengthened, reaching maximum intensity as it crossed Interstate 40, debarking trees and tossing cars thousands of feet from the roadway. It then barreled through the very northern edge of El Reno before narrowly missing the town of Piedmont and eventually dissipating near Guthrie, which is just north of Oklahoma City. This tornado was in progress for over an hour and 45 minutes over a path length of 63 miles, killing nine and injuring nearly 200 during its rampage. To set the stage, we'll look at a general progression of this storm from the Weather Service radar in Oklahoma City, KTLX. This storm developed at the southern edge of a cluster of updrafts that initiated in southwest Oklahoma. You'll notice there are several different updrafts in competition here. Just before 3 p.m., we see two to three, maybe even four updrafts trying to organize in close proximity to each other. Eventually, those updrafts merge into one larger supercell. Immediately after that happens, we develop a hook echo, and rotation begins to rapidly increase. We continue to get storm mergers into the forward flank of the supercell. Whether or not that made a difference in tornado genesis is unclear, but the tornado begins at 3.31 p.m. This first tornado near Lukiba dissipates around 3.46 p.m., and the El Reno Piedmont tornado begins at around 3.50 p.m. We see even more storm mergers during the early part of the El Reno Piedmont tornado's life cycle. We'll talk about these in just a minute. The tornado jogs to the east a bit, bringing it very close to El Reno proper, and then it takes on an absolutely menacing look. Clear as day debris ball for quite a while, even as it gets shrouded in rain north of the OKC metro, finally dissipating as the storm mode becomes less favorable near the I-35 corridor. All right, let's take a closer look by first diving into the dissipation of the initial Lukiba tornado. We're very fortunate to have some very high resolution, relatively close range data from the University of Oklahoma's RAC's pole mobile radar, whose crew is headed by Howie Bluestein. As you can see here in figure one from Hauser et al. 2015, they were located west of El Reno, southwest of Calumet, and were able to collect data on both the Lukiba tornado and the beginnings of the El Reno Piedmont tornado, which slid by just a couple miles to their south. We're going to be looking at data taken every 17 seconds between 2040 and 2055Z, which is 340 to 355 p.m., from the 4 degree and 18 degree elevation angles, so we can get a look at what's happening in the low and mid levels of the supercell, respectively. Unfortunately, with these data sets, we don't have data below 4 degrees, which is about 1 kilometer above ground level during the Lukiba tornado's dissipation phase, and about 650 meters above ground level during the genesis of the El Reno tornado, but that's still a pretty decent look at what was happening in the lower portion of the supercell and its tornadic vortices. These data sets were taken from the supplementary materials accompanying the Hauser et al. 2015 paper. Again, I'll put a link to this in the description box below. We'll start out in the mid-levels at 18 degrees. On the top left is reflectivity, top right is velocity, bottom left is differential reflectivity, and bottom right is correlation coefficient. As a quick review, differential reflectivity, or ZDR, tells us the dimensions and orientation of targets that the radar beam bounces off of. Positive ZDR represents targets that are larger in the horizontal than the vertical, and the opposite is true for negative ZDR. 
Correlation coefficient tells us how similar the objects are that the radar beam is bouncing off of. If the radar beam is hitting only similarly sized raindrops, correlation coefficient will be near 1, but if you start introducing sporadic large hail or debris lofted by tornadoes, the correlation coefficient will decrease. The first feature of note is this partial ring of enhanced ZDR right here. As discussed in Kumjin and Rizhkov 2008, this is indicative of melting hydrometeors at the edge of an updraft. In other words, hail that falls on the edges of an updraft melts due to the temperature difference between the inside and outside of the updraft, causing the hail to melt and become more oblong, hence the increase in ZDR in a ring shape around the outer edges of an updraft at mid-levels. If we were to transpose the location of this partial ZDR ring onto the velocity field, you'll see that it's right at the edge of the mesocyclone. Strong outbounds here, strong inbounds here, representative of a broad but strong mesocyclone. The vortex signature associated with the Lukiba tornado is right here. As we go forward in time past 2242Z, a new ZDR ring forms to the south of the old one, indicating the development of a new updraft. Indeed, we see a new mesocyclone develop to the southeast of the original one. The mid-level vortex then proceeds to propagate southeast and tether to the new mesocyclone. Also note the well-defined weak echo hole in reflectivity thanks to a combination of subsidence or downward motion and the centrifuging of hydrometeors outward from the tornado center. Eventually, the vortex becomes detached from the main shear zone within the new mesocyclone and dissipates by 2047Z. Now let's drop down to the low levels at the 4 degree elevation angle. Here's our ongoing tornado, and it's a little difficult to see, but in the velocity panel, here's the wind shift associated with our rear flank downdraft gust front. Lighter greens on this side, darker greens on this side. This area of dark blue pixels indicates strong inflow ahead of the RFD gust front. As we go toward 2046Z, those inflow velocities decrease drastically, and the RFD gust front surged east as more of an imbalance between the inflow and the RFD outflow developed. Here's the RFD gust front at 2046Z. By this time, correlation coefficient had dropped within the RFD gust front, likely due to lofted dust and debris picked up by the boundary, and you can see that the RFD gust front is wrapping into and around the tornadic circulation. This is indicative of the occlusion process. However, it was never able to fully wrap around and cut the tornado off from the warm inflow, so this was really a failed occlusion. The RFD surge also allowed some precipitation to surge through the hook, causing a degradation of the nice clean hook into more of a hammerhead shape. Despite the incomplete occlusion, the tornado dissipates by 2047Z. You can also see this very well-defined wind shift protruding from this large area of outbound velocities behind the main RFD gust front. This was a secondary RFD surge, and this is going to come into play in just a second as we dive into the genesis of the El Reno Piedmont tornado. Let's go back up to the mid-levels. Again, here's our original mid-level mesocyclone and our new one to the southeast at 2047.08Z. Watch what happens after 2048Z. The new meso dissipates, which leads to reorganization back into a single mesocyclone. While all this was happening, the updraft had been strengthening overall for the previous few minutes as evidenced by the bounded weak echo region, or beware, that had rapidly developed. Back down to the low levels, after dissipation the remnant circulation moves northward along the original RFD gust front and a new low level mesocyclone develops. Then the secondary RFD gust front overtakes and merges with the original RFD gust front and the new mesocyclone constricts and strengthens by 2051Z, signaling the beginning of the El Reno tornado. The merging of the secondary RFD gust front and the original RFD gust front likely augmented low-level convergence, helping to stretch pre-existing rotation into the vertical to consummate tornado genesis. Now, interestingly, the gradual constriction and strengthening of the new mesocyclone at low levels did not match the evolution of the mesocyclone in the mid-levels. As we go back up to 18 degrees, the mesocyclone remains very broad and somewhat disorganized until a sudden increase in the intensity of the vortex signature at 2051.01Z. It's unclear why this was the case, but at the very least, it's evidence that a full-fledged supercellular tornado cannot begin until the low-level and mid-level rotation are co-located, even if the low-level rotation is strong. Before the constriction and strengthening of the mid-level mesocyclone, the El Reno tornado had yet to begin, but once the vortex appeared at mid-levels and became co-located with the low-level vortex, tornado genesis was consummated. One of the unique aspects of the dissipation and genesis processes within this supercell was that they exhibited behaviors consistent with different modes of cyclic mesocyclogenesis in the mid-levels versus in the low-levels. Adlerman and Drogemeyer 2005 came up with two kinds of cyclic mesocyclogenesis, as illustrated in their figure 3 which you see here, occluding and non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. During occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis, which is outlined in the top row, 
The RFD gust front wraps around or occludes the original mesocyclone and tornado, cutting it off from the warm, moist inflow. The mesocyclone then moves rearward in the storm, and a new mesocyclone develops where the old one was at the interface of the rear flank and forward flank gust fronts. In non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis, illustrated in the bottom sequence, the original mesocyclone and tornado do not occlude, but instead move down the RFD gust front and dissipate, while a new mesocyclone forms farther north along the gust front. In the case of the El Reno supercell, the low-level vortex exhibited non-occluding cyclic characteristics as it advected toward the leading edge of the RFD gust front and then propagated along it toward the new mesocyclone at the northern edge of the RFD gust front. In contrast, the mid-levels exhibited some aspects of occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis in that a new mesocyclone developed downstream of the original one. However, the new mesocyclone did not become dominant, as is usually the case with occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. The original mesocyclone remained larger and stronger, the new mesocyclone eventually dissipated, and the El Reno tornado developed within the reorganized single mesocyclone. This is believed to be extremely rare, and this was the first case presented in the literature to exhibit these processes. Leading up to tornado genesis, the velocities increased simultaneously at almost all levels through the mesocyclone, which indicates that descending tornado genesis was not favored in this case. This is figure 12 from Hauser et al. 2015, which is a plot of delta V max, the difference between the maximum inbound and outbound pixel within the vortex signature, with respect to time on the x-axis, and height above ground level on the y-axis. The plotted points of delta V max are color-coded according to the scale on the right, with greens, yellows, oranges, and reds indicating an increasingly intense vortex. Just before 2051Z, we see an increase in delta V max at almost all levels. Notice how we go from blues and light greens to greens and yellows, with the exception of about 1.5 kilometers above ground level. It's unclear why we didn't see an increase here as well, but otherwise every level saw an increase in delta V max simultaneously at this time. For many decades, descending tornado genesis, where the vortex first intensifies aloft and then builds downward with time through processes such as dynamic piping, was thought to be the main tornado genesis mechanism in supercells. But with the proliferation of tornado genesis datasets from high-resolution mobile radars in the past several years, we've seen that that is not always the case. We've seen many cases, including the 2009 Goshen County, Wyoming tornado from Vortex 2, the 2013 El Reno tornado, the 2015 Bridge Creek, Oklahoma tornado, and several others, where the vortex either intensified in the low levels first before building upward with time, or intensified at all levels simultaneously, which was how the El Reno Piedmont tornado began. So this was just another case that illustrated that descending tornado genesis is not the preferred tornado genesis mechanism in all supercells. There are likely environmental and dynamical factors that modulate the mode of tornado genesis in supercells, but there hasn't been really any research into this arena. Hopefully that changes in the coming years. The condensation funnel rapidly increased in size after tornado genesis going from a few tendrils to a large multi-vortex to a wedge in a matter of just a few minutes. During this time, the tornado was picking up lots of debris and the tornado debris signature displayed some pretty interesting behaviors in the high resolution data. By this time, Raxpole's scanning strategy had changed so that they were only collecting data at the one degree elevation angle. This allowed for a beam height of only 20 to 55 meters above ground level, so after 2055Z we have some incredible data very near the ground as the tornado was intensifying. This data set comes from the supplementary material accompanying the Hauser et al. 2016 paper, link is in the description box below. First, the debris signature exhibited some sawtooth-like appendages that rotated around the center of the TDS. You can see these little appendages, almost like the spiral bands of a hurricane, rotating around the outer edge of the main correlation coefficient minimum. These are the result of shallow, narrow bands of asymmetric, accelerated inflow picking up dust and debris, as in this visual example of a different tornado taken from Hauser et al. 2016. You can see the narrow inflow jets there, denoted by the red arrows, feeding into the base of the main vortex. There were also a number of debris ejections, which is when bands of debris get shunted outward from the vortex. We discussed debris ejections in our case study of the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma tornado, and they're typically associated with rear flank downdraft surges. Beginning just before 2058Z, we see a band of lowered correlation coefficient that surges outward to the south and east of the main debris signature, indicating a debris ejection. You can also see a second band that begins to surge out behind the first ejection. Unfortunately, the data set I have stops here, but you can clearly see this in the next scan, which is presented in Figure 9 in Hauser et al. 2016. Now, we don't really see any velocity gradient in this area, which is unusual since we would expect one if there was an RFD surge. 
but it's possible that the velocity gradient was oriented perpendicular to the radar beam which would prohibit it from showing up well in the velocity field. There was another debris ejection that began at 2106Z which is also shown in figure 9 from Hauser et al. 2016. With this ejection we did see a clear velocity gradient associated with a secondary RFD gust front surge denoted by the red line in the velocity panel at bottom right which trails the main RFD gust front, the dash black line. The next interesting feature was this band of very weak reflectivity that develops immediately adjacent to the ongoing tornado after 2056Z. It even starts to wrap into the hook. This feature developed on the leading edge of the secondary RFD surge, which is where those outbounds are surging out just south of the tornado vortex signature. Now let's zoom in and take a closer look at the velocity field. The radar is somewhere up here. The yellows denote outbound velocities, winds moving away from the radar, and the greens denote inbound velocities, winds moving toward the radar. Here's our weak reflectivity band in the velocity field at 2057.08z. Now let's analyze the wind field around it. We have outbounds ahead of it, inbounds near its center, and outbounds behind it. Therefore, we have divergence and associated sinking motion on its southeast flank, while we have convergence and associated rising motion on its northwest or backside. If we were to look directly at this weak reflectivity band, which I've labeled WRB here, we'd have convergence and rising motion on its backside, divergence and sinking motion ahead of it. Well, that is evidence of a horizontal vortex, and we have video evidence to support this. Take a look at this video from Pecos Hank during this portion of the tornado's life cycle. If you focus just left of the ongoing wedge, you can see that horizontal rolling motion indicative of a horizontal vortex. I'll play it again without annotation so you can see it in full. Now Hank's point of view here is flipped from what it was in the radar data, so the sinking motion is on the left side, rising motion on the right, but nonetheless this is our horizontal vortex. Pretty amazing that we have both visual and radar evidence of this feature, which is fairly rare. And as a quick side note, in Hank's video you can see Rack's pulse scanning away, collecting the data that we've been analyzing this whole time. The intensification of this weak reflectivity band and associated horizontal vortex was coincident with the strengthening of the main tornado. Prior to the development of the horizontal vortex, the tornado was certainly intense, but we see a big ramp up in especially outbounds within the tornado vortex signature as the horizontal vortex becomes more evident. The horizontal vortex perhaps provided a source of more concentrated, amplified horizontal vorticity, or spin, that was able to feed into the main tornado, allowing it to intensify. The initial portion of the tornado's life cycle featured a few deviations in path, and this may have been in part due to storm mergers. Going back to our KTLX data, we see a few nascent supercells merging into the forward flank of the El Reno supercell starting at about 2055Z. These mergers did not appear to impact tornado genesis as they occurred well after the El Reno tornado began. But as we can see in this mid-level data at the 3 degree elevation angle from KTLX, the supercell's mid-level mesocyclone was fairly disorganized before and during the first merger. As the multitude of updrafts and mesocyclones interacted, the low-level vortex took a slight northward jog. Then, as the merger was ending, the mesocyclone consolidated and became vertically stacked. Before the merger, the low-level vortex was displaced from the mid-level vortex, but after the merger, the mid-level and low-level vortices were stacked right on top of each other. This is favorable for mesocyclone and tornado strengthening, and that's exactly what happened, and, as a result, the tornado turned to the east, bringing the town of El Reno into play. Finally, the El Reno-Piedmont tornado was associated with the very rare phenomenon of a tornado merger. To analyze this, we're going to use data from a couple other high-resolution research radars that were scanning this storm. The first is a phased array radar that was located at the National Weather Radar Test Bed in Norman, Oklahoma. A typical weather radar has a dish that rotates. They often take several minutes to complete a volume scan in which a full rotation is completed at each elevation angle. This can be unfavorable for analyzing tornadic supercells in real time because important storm and tornado scale behaviors and changes can occur in the time between volume scans, causing them to go unnoticed. Phased array radar alleviates this issue because it features a grid of antenna elements that can be electronically steered to focus on certain targets, like a single supercell. This means that the entire depth of a storm can be scanned in less than a minute, which is much more favorable for deciphering storm and tornado behaviors in real time. I'll be referring to the Norman-based phased array radar as the PAR. The PAR data in this case features updates every 60 seconds beginning at 2113.05z. The second radar is the MWR-05XP, which is a mobile, phased array radar originally developed for weather observation by the Naval Postgraduate School. 
The data we'll be using from the MWR 5 XP will feature updates every 11 seconds from 2133 to 2136Z, and it was gathered from the supplementary materials associated with French et al. 2015. Link in the description below. As the tornado approached the north side of El Reno, it began to decrease in intensity and become removed from the main updraft. In our PAR data here, we start off at 2113Z. At this point, the RFD gust front is attached to the tornado, which is right here. But over the next several minutes, the tornado becomes relegated well behind the RFD gust front, perhaps signaling the start of a weakening phase. Here at 2122Z, the tornado vortex signature has weakened slightly and has moved rearward relative to the RFD gust front. Then, at about 2126Z, an area of convergence develops northwest of the ongoing El Reno tornado and subsequently strengthens into a full-fledged tornado vortex signature after 2127Z. Switching over to our MWR 5 XP data, something really unique is about to ensue. For reference, here is the ongoing El Reno tornado, and here's our new tornado to the north. The two vortices undergo a Fujiwara effect, rotating counterclockwise around each other before merging into one wider, much stronger vortex that remains strong for quite a while. I'll play this loop at full speed so you can see it better. We have visual confirmation of this as well. This is a series of photographs taken between 2133 and 2138Z, so 433 to 438 p.m., by SBC meteorologist Roger Edwards, who is located four miles west-southwest of Piedmont. In this first image from 2133Z, two distinct tornadoes are visible. The larger one on the left is the original El Reno tornado, and the cone on the right is the new vortex. By 2134Z, the two tornadoes had moved closer to each other and were about to merge, and by 2136Z, we had one singular, much stronger tornado that would continue to increase in size as it moved toward Piedmont. It was even accompanied by a small satellite vortex, as you see here. This kind of tornado merger is fairly rare and is often associated with intense tornadoes. One of the only other well-documented examples of this was the Heston and Gessel, Kansas tornadoes on March 13, 1990. In the footage here, you see the original Heston tornado on the left and a new tornado developing on the right. The two tornadoes approach and then come in very close proximity to one another, revolving around each other in a Fujiwara-esque manner. Eventually, they merge into a single, stronger, much larger tornado near Gessel that would become an F5. So that about does it for the El Reno Piedmont storm, just an absolute monster by every metric. There's certainly more we could have talked about regarding that storm, so if you're interested in learning more, be sure to check out the links in the description box below. Farther to the south, there were a couple more storms of note. As additional development occurred along the dry line, two supercells gathered steam and produced long track tornadoes. The northernmost one put down an EF4 very near Chickasha at 5.06 p.m. that tracked for 33 miles into the southwest side of Oklahoma City, while the southern one had the same outcome, a 23 mile long EF4 that started near Washington at 5.26 p.m. and dissipated near Goldsby about 40 minutes later. Thankfully, the OKC Metro was spared from a more significant disaster as both of these tornadoes were tracking right up into the city. The Chickasha storm underwent a merger several minutes before tornado genesis. You can see this storm to the south moving north and merging with the ongoing supercell, and immediately after the merger is completed, the storm really starts to crank, and we get tornado genesis about 10 minutes after completion near Chickasha, just after 22Z. If we zoom out, you'll notice that this storm that merged with the ongoing supercell was actually a left split from the storm to the south, which would become the Goldsby tornado producer. I wish we had a mobile radar on this storm so we could really see the nuances of the merger, but the merger clearly aided in the intensification of the supercell and possibly tornado genesis. At the time of the outbreak, the National Science Foundation's Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere, or CASA, had deployed a network of four high-resolution prototype radars across southwest Oklahoma in an attempt to fill the gaps in low-level coverage associated with the standard Weather Service radar network. These radars were able to complete a low-level volume scan every minute, which, as we discussed earlier, is a lot more favorable for analyzing tornadic supercells. And, as luck would have it, one of these CASA radars was located in downtown Chickasha, within two miles of the Chickasha tornado. So we have excellent low-level data of the supercell and its surrounds. One of the interesting features the CASA radar detected was a subtle surface boundary in the clear air region ahead of the supercell. Check out this data presented in Figure 4 from Brodsky and Luttrell 2015. The top row, row A, is reflectivity. B is velocity, C is differential reflectivity, and D is correlation coefficient. Each column shows a different scan every minute from 2206 to 2209Z.
You can easily pick out the fine line associated with this boundary on all the products in each scan. On reflectivity, it's the subtle milky white line I've outlined in pink right on the northern edge of this blob of inbound velocities. It also shows up on differential reflectivity and correlation coefficient, suggesting that dust or biological targets were being picked up by the boundary. You can see how the supercell latches onto the boundary. The tip of the hook begins to coil inward, really grabbing that boundary and ingesting it, deforming the boundary in the process. Over the next couple of minutes, the hook really coils up, and we have a full-fledged tornado. The question is, where did this boundary come from? As described in Brodsky and Luttrell 2015, the boundary passed directly over the Oklahoma Mesonet Station at Ninica, just south of Chickasha, with little change in temperature or moisture. However, the winds did change, veering from southeasterly to southwesterly after it passed. One hypothesis is that it could be some sort of outflow boundary or gust front from the storm to the south, which would be the soon-to-be Goldsby EF4 producer. But given that the air mass behind the boundary was not significantly cooler, this doesn't make a ton of sense, although the orientation of the boundary does parallel the northern edge of the storm to the south. Whatever the cause, it was very interesting to observe this boundary in the tornado genesis process in such fine detail that would otherwise not be possible with the typical weather service radar network. All right, let's close things out by doing our standard model proximity sounding analysis. Back in 2011, the rapid refresh model, or the RAP, that we typically use for this exercise, was not around yet. Instead, we're going to use soundings from its predecessor, the rapid update cycle, or RUC. We're going to look at a series of RUC soundings from Oklahoma City, which of course was just east of the El Reno storm and just northeast of the Chickasha and Goldsby storms, starting at 12Z, 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time on May 24th. Now the archive I use has a few hours missing, namely 15 to 16 Z and 22 Z, but we should still be able to get a good sense of how the atmosphere progressed in proximity to these storms that day. Starting at 12 Z, as we discussed earlier, we had a very stout cap in place thanks to the deep elevated mixed layer that had invected over the region. Fairly shallow, low level moisture to start. The moist layer doesn't even extend up to 850 millibars, but nonetheless, we were already quite unstable with over 1700 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. Strong low-level jet in place to start the morning, right at the end of the nocturnal cycle during which the low-level jet tends to ramp up quite a bit, so we would expect this to calm down a bit through the morning into the early afternoon and pick up again once that low-level cyclone really started to strengthen out west. Not much change throughout the morning, but by noon, the moist layer had deepened some given strong low-level warm moist advection. The cap was a bit stubborn, but was gradually eroding as the low levels warmed and moistened, and as the trough inched its way east. Low-level shear was still pretty strong, but would continue to decrease through early afternoon. That cap would never fully go away, but it really wasn't enough to thwart robust sustained convection along the dry line. By 20Z, strong instability of nearly 4,000 joules per kilogram with only negative 23 joules per kilogram of mixed layer convective inhibition. Given the forcing from the trough and dry line and the strong low-level shear, that little bit of a warm nose didn't really play any inhibiting role in the event. Speaking of shear, low-level hodographs began to enlarge once again, with nearly 200 meters squared per second squared of effective storm relative helicity, and by 21Z, that would jump to nearly 350 meters squared per second squared. That, coupled with over 4,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape and minimal convective inhibition, is no question a textbook significant tornado environment. Now, as I just mentioned, the data archive I used did not have ruck soundings at 22Z, but thankfully, the awesome U.S. Tornadoes case archive does have proximity soundings in the inflow regions of both the El Reno and Chickasha supercells at 22Z. Here's the El Reno sounding, and again, this is just a classic significant tornado sounding. 78 over 70 at the surface, large instability in excess of 3,000 joules per kilogram, very large looping hodographs, and the Chickasha sounding was very similar. Lots of almost purely streamwise vorticity in the lowest kilometer or so of the atmosphere. As we've discussed before, streamwise vorticity is when your storm relative wind vector, drawn from the storm motion to the level of interest on the hodograph, is parallel to the horizontal vorticity vector, which is always perpendicular and to the left of the hodograph at the level of interest. All a storm has to do in a high streamwise vorticity environment is tilt and stretch that spin into the vertical, and the storm is ready for tornado genesis, assuming all other environmental factors are there. And you can see here, ample streamwise vorticity in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. No wonder these supercells were able to produce significant to violent tornadoes. So that's going to wrap things up for this video. May 24, 2011 was certainly one of the more classic Southern Plains tornado outbreaks in recent memory, with multiple supercells producing strong to violent tornadoes across central Oklahoma. We're also very fortunate to have had such amazing high resolution radar data collected during this event to really dig into the storm and tornado behaviors, which were quite unique, especially in the El Reno Piedmont supercell. Hopefully you learned something about why this event was such a unique yet textbook outbreak, 
And it's only a matter of time before Oklahoma sees another one of these destructive events. With that, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.